How's everybody doing tonight? Good to see you. Welcome to our teaching on spiritual growth. This is uh, stage two, track two. You've already had stage two, track one. This is stage two, track two. And I want to begin with just a really, really quick review about what we're doing. Uh, I have spent my whole ministry practically. Connie and I have been in the ministry for, we've been in the ministry for 35 years or more. And I have, I have spent regular, regular intervals of my ministry saying this, we're saying this to each other. We thought they were more mature than that. Have you ever thought that about somebody? You ever thought that about yourself? Yeah. You ever done something and thought, I thought I was more mature than that. I can't believe that I just acted out in the flesh. Well, I have said that not only about myself, but I've said that about church members. You know, I've been pastoring somebody for 10 years, and then they, they do something, and I, I, thought, I thought they were more mature than that. But after about 35 years of saying that, I thought, something's not right. And I, so I just started really praying and seeking God and asking God to kind of show me, you know, but God, I thought this person was more mature than that. And, and even sometimes, to be honest with you, I thought I was more mature than, you know, I'm, I'm the pastor. I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I had that attitude I had to deal with. And so that's, God began to show me, and God actually has been showing me over a period of about 20 years, this whole idea of the stages of spiritual growth, and that the reason that a person can be a Christian for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and still not be mature in some area of their life is that we have not systematically dealt with the uh, stages of spiritual growth in our life. You do not teach a child how to drive a car until they first know how to tie their shoes. I hope. And so there are things that, you know, here I have on this chart, I've written up here, just, just this, is, uh, this is not everything. This is just some of the highlights of the stages of spiritual growth. Newborns, the, and the Bible is very specific about this. All of these have scripture to go with this. The Bible talks about newborn believers, toddlers, the Greek word napios, newborn believers, brephos. The Bible talks about adolescents, the Greek word paidon, and then uh, uh Adults, the Greek word teleos, and the Bible's very clear about the characteristics of each one of these stages of spiritual growth. The Bible's very clear about saying you can recognize a spiritual newborn because of the characteristics. You can recognize a spiritual toddler because of their characteristics. And then the Bible's very clear about talking about what a person needs to do to grow from one stage to the next. And so a newborn, the Bible outlines that a newborn needs to understand the word soteria, which is uh, the Greek word for salvation. And it's, uh, it's, it means physical healing as well as uh, deliverance, preservation, safety. Uh, then there's the uh, kingdom of God. Newborns need to understand the kingdom of God, need to lay aside malice, guile, hypocrisy, and learn to desire the word. And we spend mostly Sunday mornings dealing with these issues right here. Then toddlers, uh, napios, conquering envy, strife, division, we covered all this, these things uh, in the last class. We're going to be talking about in, stage, in uh, uh, track two here of stage uh, two. This is stage two. Newborns, toddlers, we named these, tra these stages track one, two, three, and four, not newborns, toddlers, adolescents, and adults. The reason is because you would not be here if this was the toddler class. Nobody would have come. I don't want to be in the, I'm not, I'm a, I'm a mature Christian. I don't belong in the toddler class. And so, so on your sheet and the way we're talking about these are this, these are, this is stage one teaching, stage two teaching, stage three teaching, and stage four teaching, which is actually uh, maturity. So you can see some of the different things, knowing the Father, the anointing, visions, operation of spiritual gifts that belongs with adolescents and then adults, those things there. Now here's what happens. What happens is we get piecemeal, we get a little bit of teaching on the kingdom of God, we get some teaching on faith, we get some teaching then on the operation of spiritual gifts, and before you know it, you've got people who have not dealt with, remember how much time we spent last time talking about the flesh and overcoming carnality? You don't remember that? 
Some of you are in the wrong class. Uh, we, spent, we spent weeks talking about overcoming carnality, what carnality is. Because what we got is we got people trying to operate in spiritual gifts that have never dealt with this. Because this is an adolescent, this is a stage three maturity issue. And we've got to learn to tie our shoes before we learn to drive the car. Just making sense to anyone. So, this is, these are the stages of spiritual growth, and this is why we're dealing with these issues. I know we spent a lot of time talking about this last time, but I just wanted to give you a refresher course so you could go, oh, now I understand why. I, now I remember why I'm here. So, we're still talking about stage two. We talked about conquering envy, strife, division. We talked about overcoming carnality. And so, now... To continue with stage two, if you'll turn with me to the book of Hebrews, the big book of Hebrews chapter six, this is where we're going to pick up Hebrews chapter six. And we're going to uh, still in stage two, we're going to talk about some more of the issues. This is track two of stage two. So uh, we've had a little break. And so during this break, have you found yourself using any of the things that you, you, that you learned in track one? You, you have? You've, you've used some of those things. You've realized, uh, because what I want you to do is grow. I want, you to, I want you to grow. And there's nothing wrong with being a newborn. The, only, the worst thing about being a newborn is not knowing that you are one and thinking you're an adult. And that's rampant in the body of Christ today. We've got Christians trying to act like spiritual adults, operating with, uh, in trying to operate in spiritual gifts, trying to give people words from God and trying to give people prophecies. We believe in words from God and prophecies, but we like to have those from mature believers. Uh, I'm not getting anywhere with this. All right. So, but uh, uh, anyway, have you found Hebrews 6 yet? Hebrews, actually Hebrews 5, 12. Hebrews 5.12, uh, these lights are, if, if this is how bright they need to be for this video, then I'll endure it. They're really bright. So whatever, how, however much dimness you can give me will be helpful, but whatever you need, you determine that and I'll deal with it. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a napios. It says babe there, but the Greek word is the Greek word napios, which actually means a toddler. He is a toddler. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, Hebrews 6, 1, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to maturity. We're going to go on to teleos. We're going to go on to adulthood, not laying again. And now what he's, what he's going to do is outline the toddler issues, the stage two issues that these people have had to go back and revisit. And he lists them here. Uh, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, faith toward God, the doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. These six things. And this we will do if God permits. So he's talking about uh, repentance, faith, baptisms. Well, there's three of them. Uh, and all I did was hit the high spots. This is not everything you, you understand. But I hit the high spots here. Uh, but he lists them right here. And these are the six things. If you look on your sheet, you can see number one is our adoption as sons. And we're going to talk about that after we get through Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. But it lists them there, repentance from dead works. Faith toward God, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, water baptism, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. So today I want to talk about water baptism. And he, he here mentions, he doesn't mention, he's talking to people, keep in mind, that in New Testament times, <clears throat> there was no such thing as a Christian 
who had not been baptized. They did not exist. There were, there were no Christians. Now in our churches today, there are people that, well, you know, I don't know. I, I wasn't here on baptism Sunday or, or, you know, I really don't, I'm not really fond of getting my hair wet. Uh, you know, I don't understand. They say it's symbolic anyway. So what's the big deal? So we have, our churches are full of people who have not been baptized. In the New Testament church, there was nobody who wasn't baptized because that was the, uh, that was the only response to the gospel. You wanted to become a Christian, they baptized you right then. Right then, it stopped everything, and they baptized people. And that was, um, that was uh, the response to the gospel. So now, when we're talking about baptism, here uh, Paul uh, wants us to understand the doctrine of water baptism. He is not here making a case for people, for why they should be baptized. Because they've already been baptized. This is a letter to the Hebrews, Hebrew Christians. They've already been baptized. So he, this is, he's not making a case, come on, please, we want more people to be baptized. He's saying that one of the foundations of the Christian life that we must understand is the doctrine, the scriptural basis, the purpose of baptism. The scriptural basis and the purpose of baptism is something that continually unfolds. We don't baptize, we baptize here anybody who pretty much who feels like they want to be baptized. And if people say that they want to be rebaptized, we for whatever reason we will rebaptize somebody. They just say, you know, my first baptism, I just I I don't know. I just feel like I want to be rebaptized. Then we will do it. But I don't encourage it. I do encourage it. If someone has backslidden, just completely backslidden, fallen away from the Lord, and then comes back to the Lord, they need to be baptized again. But I hear it from time to time, I want to be baptized again because the first time I was baptized, I didn't really understand everything about it. But now hearing you teach on it, I understand what it is, and I want to be baptized again. I don't necessarily, uh, we, if that person just pounds their fist and just insists, we will baptize them. But I don't encourage that. And the reason is because we're constantly growing and learning in every area of the Christian life. That's like saying, well, I want to get saved again because I didn't understand everything that I had in salvation when I first gave my life to Christ. I didn't know I had healing. Now I just sat in a healing class. Now I understand I have healing. So can I give my life to Christ again? Well, no, you already did that. You're just, you're just learning and you're growing in God. And so we're learning and growing in God in all the different areas of our Christian life, including baptism. So if you've already been baptized since you've been walking with God, then you don't need to be baptized again. These people had already been baptized. But what Paul is saying is, I want you to understand what's behind baptism, the doctrine of baptism. So let's talk about that for just a moment. I want you to go with me to the book of Matthew chapter 3. And a lot of what we need to know about baptism is in Matthew chapter 3. There are a lot of scriptures about baptism, about how to be baptized and why to be baptized, uh, a lot more than we're going to get into tonight. But I want to talk with you about Matthew chapter 3. And this is Jesus's baptism. In Matthew chapter 3, have you got it? Everybody got Matthew chapter 3? Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, or actually verse 13, 13 through 17. Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. Now, John is Jesus' cousin, and John and Jesus are only a few months apart. John and Jesus actually may have played together as, when they were kids, and John is preaching a message of repentance. And John has a very large following of people preaching a, the gospel, a, a message of repentance. So then Jesus, John's cousin, shows up and Jesus asks John to baptize him. And John says, I need to be baptized by you and you're coming to me. The reason that John reacts this way is because John has recognized, the Bible is clear that John has recognized that Jesus, his cousin, is the Messiah. And because Jesus is the Messiah, John knows that his baptism is a baptism of repentance. And the Messiah doesn't have anything to repent of. 
Because he's never, John knows that the Messiah is sinless. That's interesting, thinking that Jesus and John may have played together. How many of you ever played together with anybody when you were kids that was sinless? Most of us wanted to knock each other out at one time. You know, we loved each other, but then we hated each other the next day, and then we loved each other, and then we were mad at each other the next day. And for John to grow up and recognize that somebody he knew from childhood was the Messiah, I think is remarkable. John recognizes that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus comes to him and says, I want to be baptized by you. And John says, I need to be baptized by you because he knew that Jesus, even from a child, was the sinless Messiah. So anyway, verse 15 is amazing about baptism because Jesus answered and said to John, permit it to be so now for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. One of the the amazing things about Jesus' life, I think, even as God in the flesh, I think one of the the amazing things about Jesus' life is Jesus' obedience. Jesus, the Bible says, obeyed his Father. Jesus obeyed the Word. There is even a scripture that says Jesus obeyed the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit spoke to him. Going beyond that, Jesus obeyed his parents. The Bible says that Jesus learned obedience through the things which he suffered. So what did Jesus suffer? Well, we know Jesus didn't suffer sickness and disease, except on the cross he took our sicknesses and diseases. What did Jesus suffer? What suffering did Jesus do that taught him obedience? Jesus obeyed earthly authority. And I know us as being being, uh, uh, you know, being born into sin, we're always wanting to claim our rights. We're always wanting to say, hey, you can't tell me what to do because I'm so-and-so. I'm such-and-such. I've got this right. I've got that right. So here we have the sinless son of God. We have God in the flesh who created the universe, John chapter 1 says. And yet when he came to, to the earth in the form of a man, of a human, the Bible says that he was obedient to his father, that he obeyed his parents, that he, obe- that he was obedient even to the death of the cross. He was obedient. It's one of the remarkable things about the life of God on the earth is his obedience. So now here John says, well, I need, be, need to be baptized to you and you're coming to me. And here's what Jesus says. John, let's go ahead and do this to fulfill what the word says. We're going to go ahead and do this to fulfill all righteousness. And so then when uh, Jesus said that, the Bible says that John baptized Jesus. He permitted it. And when Jesus had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And Jesus saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So now so many things happened at Jesus's baptism. We have the spirit of God descending on him as a dove. We have heaven opening and God speaking. It's really a remarkable event. And the Bible says that we also are to be baptized. Now, uh, I have this theory that if Jesus needs to be baptized, I probably do. I'm just, I'm just thinking... You know, if it's something, you know, here we got the sinless son of God saying he needs to be baptized and I probably need to be baptized too. Now, here again, we're talking about the doctrine of baptisms. So let me explain to you about the doctrine of baptisms. The Christian life begins with a series of baptisms. There are actually three bapti- baptisms listed in the Bible. Three. Three. And baptisms consist of who is being baptized, who is doing the baptizing, and what they're being baptized into. So you got, most of us are familiar with water baptism. So a church leader baptizes an individual into water. So you got who's doing the baptism, baptizing, who's being baptized, and what they're being baptized into. There are three of those. 
Be sure and take these down. First of all, uh, the Christian life, it begins with a series of baptisms. And the first one that it, that it begins with in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, talks about being baptized by the Holy Spirit into the church. That's the first thing that happens. You are a person is baptized when a person makes a decision to follow Christ and the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of them. Then 1 Corinthians 12, 13 indicates that an individual, that the Holy Spirit then baptizes this individual into the body, into the church. So you actually become a part of, it's not that you go to your local church, you are actually baptized into, you actually become a part of the local church at that point. So do I, do I need to go to church? Do I have to? Do now that, so I, I raised my hand. I made a decision to follow Christ. So now what? Do I need, to go, I need to come to church now? It's so much more than do I need to come to church because you have the word baptize means to immerse. One, uh, one Greek lexicon defines baptism as to waterlog. Like anybody ever left a baseball out in the rain? You go out to get it and it's, Completely, well, you pick it up and it's all wet and dripping. It's, we call it. We say, "Well, sorry, kids, you can't play with this ball anymore because it's waterlogged. It's completely immersed. It's dripping with water. It's so wet." And that's actually the Greek term for baptize is the Greek word baptizo, b a p t i z o, and it means to immerse or to actually waterlog. And so, the First Corinthians twelve thirteen talks about being baptized, being waterlogged, being completely immersed by the Holy Spirit into the church. It's one of the most challenging things that we have to do as believers because everybody expects me as the pastor to want everybody to come to church. So what do I need to do? So I just, got, uh, just gave my life to Christ. Now what? Now you need to come to church. When? All the time. I don't need to come on Sunday night, do I? Yep. What about Wednesday night spiritual growth? Yeah. So I. So what about Sunday morning? Yeah. What about men's breakfast? Yeah. What about sisterhood? Yeah. What about yeah? Yeah. Well, what about yeah? Because the Holy Spirit has immersed you into the church. Why? Because you can grow. You can. Uh, uh, you can. A lot of the Christian life, folks, is caught. It's not just taught. It's caught. When you're with people, when you're hanging around people, you can catch it. You can, you can learn how to pray just by praying with somebody else coming on Sunday nights and praying with the church. You can learn how to pray that way Amen. by praying with people. You can learn how to grow in God by hanging around with, with other people who are ahead of you in God. So the first one, the Christian life begins with a series of baptisms. The first one is being baptized by the Holy Spirit into the church. The second one is being baptized by by church leaders into water. That's the second baptism that happens in the life of a believer. And that needs to happen as soon as possible after a person makes a decision to follow Christ. We don't baptize, uh, you know, immediately, you know, people raise their hand. Who wants to make a decision to follow Christ? Okay, everybody come on up here. We've got to change of clothes for you in the back. We're going to baptize you right now. We don't necessarily do it that way, but you need to take people who make a decision to follow Christ need to be baptized as soon after they make a decision as possible. Then thirdly, being baptized by Jesus into the Holy Spirit. And that's the, what we're going to talk about next week, which is the third baptism that happens in the life of in, in the Christian life. It begins, your Christian life begins with a series of baptisms, being baptized into the church, being baptized into water, and being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And all of these things can happen in pretty rapid succession. I know in my life, it was, I gave my life to Christ. And then it was some months after that I was baptized. And it was some years after that before I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And it can happen that a person can be baptized into the church by the Holy Spirit. A person makes a decision to follow Christ. At that moment, they are baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body, the Bible says. Then it can happen right after that that a person is water baptized. Then right after that, a week, a week after that, or sometimes I've seen people get baptized in water and come out of the water speaking in tongues. 
and experiencing the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But those things can happen in rapid succession within one of two, one or two weeks of each other. A person can have all the baptisms down, these three foundational baptisms, and then get on with their Christian life with these things all intact. But when we stretch them out, we give our life to Christ, and then we wait five years to get baptized, then we wait another 15 years to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. There are all these things that the Holy Spirit wants to do in our life that, that never come to fruition because we spread these out so much. And that's not how it was in the New Testament church. These things happen just like that. So talking about water baptism and talking about the doctrine of water baptism, the doctrine of water baptism, I, I don't want to disappoint you, but it really is relatively simple. The doctrine of water, it's much simpler than the other two. I could preach for weeks on being baptized into the body, and I could preach for weeks on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But when it comes to water baptism and the doctrine of water baptism, it's relatively simple. Uh, simple. First of all, it is symbolic of what happened to you that you died. The, you know, when, when a person is baptized, and you've, you've heard us talk about this before, that they go under the water and they come out of the water, it's symbolic of you dying to yourself. And so often, baptism is exactly that is a person dying to themselves. Because remember what Jesus said in Matthew 3, 15, when John said, Jesus, you shouldn't be, I shouldn't be baptizing you. You should be baptizing me. And Jesus said, let's do this to fulfill all righteousness. John, let's just do this to fulfill the word. I don't know if John actually understood what all that meant or not, but Jesus is saying, I want to fulfill the word. So ju let's just baptize me now. It's the act of obedience and commitment that answers the question, are you really going to do this? Anyone in an emotional moment can raise their hand and pray a prayer in a church service. Anybody can do that. That's relatively simple. simple. Anybody can do that. The question that baptism answers is, are you really seriously going to do this? Because I've talked to people who have raised their hand, made a decision to follow Christ. Okay, so baptisms are next Sunday. So, you know, show up, man, we'll baptize you. I don't, I don't know. I don't know about the, we'll see. I, I, I don't know about the baptism thing. I don't know if I'm ready for that. We'll, we'll see. And what that tells me is that they have not, they raised their hand, they prayed the prayer, but they have not yet made up their mind, I'm actually going to do this. I'm actually going to lay down my life. I'm actually going to crucify my own flesh. I'm going to die to myself and I'm going to live for Christ. That's what you're saying when you're baptized. And so re people raising their hand is kind of a step. You know, there's the, re you know, there's bow your head, raise your hand. Pray the prayer. Go get the go at the end of the service and get the Bible and the book and the CD to get you started in your walk with God. All of these are steps in our culture. They're not an end in themselves. I'm trying to get people to the baptism tank. That's what I, that's where I'm really trying to get people is to be baptized. And all of these steps are to finally cause people to, uh, to be confronted with the question, are you actually going to do this or not? Are you actually going to walk this out? Are you actually willing to, well, I don't understand why I have to be baptized because the Bible says so. Wow, that's where the rubber meets the road right there. That's where we find out is somebody really serious. We count decisions here. Hey, we had, uh, I think we had seven decisions for Christ this past weekend. So we count the decisions, we count the hands, we count the pay, people that prayed the prayer, and we count the, the, the people that go to the table and get the Bibles and stuff, and, and all of that's important. But what we're really looking for are people who say, I want to be sold out for Jesus Christ. And it's the baptism tank that says that. It's not raising your hand while everybody's bowing their head and closing their eyes and nobody's looking around. Anybody can do that. We've had people raise their hand, pray the prayer, and then, and then come up 
And I want to congratulate them. And you know, I'm so excited about the decisions that you made. We're very careful, by the way, not to call those salvations because we don't know that they were. When a person raises their hand and prays a prayer, you'll never hear me say we had, we had seven salvations. You'll never hear me say that. We had seven decisions. People made a decision. They raised their hand, prayed the prayer, and they made a decision. When we know that God's beginning to do a work in their life is when they get to the baptism tank. And they're willing to stand up in front of you and their family and everybody else and say, I made a decision to follow Christ. <clears throat> uh, well, I mean, we have had people raise their hand, pray the prayer, and come up and, and meet congratulations. Wow, you made a decision to follow Christ. I'm so, I'm so excited for you. And, I, and I've actually had people say, well, actually what we really hoping is that the church would pay our electric bill for us. And it, it wasn't a, you made a decision to follow Christ, didn't you? Well, yeah, but they're going to cut off our electricity day after tomorrow if, if somebody doesn't help us. And so we were hoping we could come up here and talk to you. And, you, and they're, that's a, if they need that, that's a separate issue. But they were completely oblivious to, you know, I made a decision to follow Christ. I'm laying down my life and I'm taking on a new life and I'm going to walk with God. And where's the water? Put me in the baptism tank. I'm sold out to Jesus. I raised my hand. I prayed the prayer. Now will you pay my bill? So you can't go on that. And what baptism is, baptism is actually the, what time is it? I'd love to get into this. Baptism, I'm going to. <laughs> baptism, I got a couple of really great discussion questions for you. But baptism is the circumcision of the New Testament. Old, in the Old Testament, <clears throat> there was a, um, the, in the Old Testament, males were circumcised. There's a, there's a, uh, the skin on the foreskin of their penis was cut off as a sign of their covenant between them and God. It's really interesting. I've had people ask me, that's kind of creepy. Why would God do that? Why is that a sign of a co of the covenant? Watch this. It's because the seed of the man passes through into the woman right through that sign of the covenant. And so it's, it's, a, it's a sign of the covenant through perpetual generations. We are passing on that sign of the covenant, and our children are actually born through that sign of the covenant. So that was in the Old Testament. That was the, the uh, sign that a person uh, was committed to God, and it was actually done in infants. But then in the New Testament, Paul says that what makes a man clean before God is not the circumcision of the flesh, but it's a conscience, a pure conscience that's turned toward God. So now we're back to the obedience factor again. And baptism is actually the circumcision of the New Testament. It's the sign of the covenant of the New Testament. So, um, it, certainly, it certainly is oftentimes a supernatural experience. Remember, the, the main thing, and look what Jesus experienced. Jesus came out of the water, and the Holy Spirit descended on him from the sky like a dove, and then the heavens opened, and God spoke. How many of you think that's a pretty supernatural baptism occurrence there? I, haven't, I have been baptizing people for probably 35 years, and I have yet for that to happen. But I have seen supernatural occurrences happen. I have seen people that had issues they couldn't get over, but they, but they I mean, they'd gone for eight years and just refused to be, why, why haven't you been baptized? I just, I just don't want to. I had, Connie asked one lady, Connie, we had a lady in our church that we were having some real issues. She was having issues. I mean, she just, the issues were just insurmountable. It's just like, you know, we were having issues with her, but she was having issues with herself. And her husband was having issues. There were all these, and Connie's trying to counsel her and help her and talk her through some things. And she's praying for this lady. Oh, what is the 
deal with this lady. And she's praying. And one day she met with this lady and the Holy Spirit spoke to her. Just bam. And Connie said, the Holy Spirit spoke to me clearly. I knew exactly what to ask her. She said, I asked this lady, she said, have you ever been baptized in water? This lady had been a Christian for years, 20 years. Have you ever been baptized in water? She said, oh, no. No, I've never been baptized in water. Connie said, well, why not? She said, well, I don't, I don't want to get my hair wet. And Connie tried to explain to her the importance of baptism. You know, you can, you know, you can dry your hair. You can get your hair fixed or whatever. Baptism is important. Took her through the scriptures, showed her what the Bible said about baptism. And this woman absolutely refused to get baptized. Would not, and she just got worse and worse and worse. She got, she, I'm not, it was, it got, it got ugly everywhere. It got ugly in her family, got ugly in the church. It got un, ugly in her own heart. I mean, it was, and, and the whole issue was, I am not going to obey God in this area. I don't want, I'll pray, but I'm not going to get baptized. And baptism was the very first act of, in the New Testament church, she couldn't have even become a Christian in the book of Acts. If she wasn't willing to be baptized. So there are supernatural things that happen in baptism. I've seen people get baptized in the Holy Spirit who, who had issues with getting their prayer language and, and all this stuff. And I've seen them come out of the water uh, with their prayer language. I've seen people come out of the water with, uh, and it's not a cure-all. It's not, well, you know, can I get baptized next Sunday and then, and then all my problems are going to go away. It's not that. But it, it begins a, um, it begins a cycle in your life where you just say, you know, I'm going to obey God. I'm going to be obedient. I, I love to make baptism deeper than this, water baptism. But really, water baptism is all about obedience. It's all about obeying God. It's all about that covenant and that sign of the covenant. I died on the cross for you and I shed my blood for you. What are you willing to do? You know, so, well, salvation's a free gift. Jesus died on the cross so we could have this free gift. Yes, but once you, once you receive this free gift, that means that you're willing to turn over everything to God. Everything. It's amazing people that'll give money, but they won't be water baptized. It's amazing people that'll do different. We like to, we like to pick and choose what we want to do for God. Oh God, I would never do that. I don't want, no, I don't want this prayer language thing. I, that's, that's weird to me. I don't want that. But I'll do this. And we want to pick and choose. And the, with the beginning your Christian life with the three baptisms, being baptized into the body, then being baptized into water, then being baptized in the Holy Spirit, by the time a person experiences those three baptisms, they pretty much laid down everything. And now you're ready. Now a person is ready to be used by God, at least ready to go through, to grow through these steps. And these steps, it's hard to grow through these steps if you're not willing to be baptized. See, baptism belongs here. The act of baptism belongs here. Paul put the doctrine of baptisms here. So, uh, so obedience is everything in the Christian life. Amen. Amen.